Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm here with James Shearett, who is formerly with Slack, a local Vancouver company. Um, and uh, James, you worked as the strategist overseeing executive programs. And today, I understand, as you have recently left Slack, that you really now are a startup advisor working in the tech world. Yeah, for the most part, um, I've, I've got kind of a portfolio of things that I'm up to right now. Startup advisors, most of it. Um, I just am volunteering some personal projects and some writing. That's excellent. So um, you worked in um, kind of the tech world for 20 years, um, most recently for Slack, uh, which is super interesting because, I mean, they are uh, kind of a storybook success story here in Vancouver. Can you tell us just maybe a little bit about what your role was at Slack and also what what is Slack? Sure. So um, Slack is a real-time communication collaboration platform. Um, it started actually out of a game, which is kind of interesting. Mm. Um, so a company called Tiny Spec was creating a game called Glitch back in 2009. Mm-hmm. And the team behind it actually had done the same thing previously, which is they'd created a game called Game Never Ending mm. in the early 2000s. Game Never Ending actually never picked up and, and became the key success that they wanted it to be. But there was a feature in it for photo sharing that became really successful. Mm. And they pivoted from Game Never Ending into a company called Flickr. Flickr yes. was a great success and sold yes. to Yahoo for $25 million. And okay. that was sort of the core team behind Slack kind of worked at Yahoo for three years and yeah. then decided they wanted to get the band back together again. And so the co-founders are all the same folks. Yeah. And they said, uh, let's make a game. We want to make a game. So they started <laughs> out in 2009, raised some money and started creating a game called Glitch. Uh, Glitch went on for a while. They grew the team to like 55 people, but it really wasn't getting the kind of dynamics that they needed it to um, in order to be a venture-backed startup. Mm. Um, so they pivoted again. They they realized that internally they had created a uh, communication and collaboration system um, that uh, they would never work without again. Mm. It was essential to how they actually worked across different offices, different time yeah. zones and stuff like that. And uh, perhaps there were others who wanted that same kind of yeah. system. Yeah. And so they laid off most of the team. They got down to like eight people and um, ended up then um, pivoting to Slack full time, um, rebranding. And I was the ninth person to join the team in June of 2013. Wow. And that was kind of like where we were very, very early. We were like, what is this thing? How do we describe it? How do we talk about it to people? Are, would they care at all about yeah. it? Um, how do we get people to use it? Like all that kind of stuff. Um, so the first job that I had with Slack, uh, I had I ended up having five jobs with Slack. The first job was just marketing consulting, like yeah. trying to help them get that to market. One of the key things that I was doing at that time was uh, really talking to customers, mm. asking them open-ended questions about how they communicated, yeah. um, listening, understanding how Slack might fit into essentially the things that they were doing already. Um, and what we discovered is that like everybody needed to communicate and nobody had any good way of doing it. Right. It was always this kind of cobbled together system yeah. of like email plus yeah. Skype plus yeah. file sharing, Dropbox and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, when you proposed that they try something different or try something new, it was really challenging because, like, you didn't have to just convince one person. You had to convince, like, four or five people at least, yeah. a team. Yeah. And they had to change the way that they worked. Yeah. And so there was a lot of risk for the person who originally wanted to propose it. Um, so those are some of the real insights that we had to figure out at the yeah. early stage and then yeah. understand, like, how do we then go to market with right. something that's a really simple value proposition that somebody can say, let's try this thing. Yeah. Um, and people can figure out and get that kind of like early, early, really quick reward of like, right. this is better than the way we used to do things. Yeah. Um, and then be able to bring, uh, add additional people onto it. Yeah. And oh, that's amazing. So that was my first job with Slack. Yeah. So Slack in the, um, uh, in the growth as employee number nine, how big has Slack it? Uh, gotten since maybe you just left yeah so slack's a public company now um it was announced late in 2020 that they were going to be acquired by salesforce i mm -hmm. think the number is 28 billion dollars 28 billion yeah yeah with a so, B. yeah so uh, <laughs> a good health a healthy number um and i think it had grown to about 22 23 maybe even 2400 people in you wow. know I, I don't know 15 20 offices around the world wow that is incredible that yeah is yeah incredible growth yeah it's a i mean it's it's one of a kind story in many ways and lots of people like one of the things that I do in startup advisory work is to tell people like yes you want to be like Slack the chances of you being like Slack are probably not very strong right so let's deal with probabilities <laughs> and uh, make good wow. decisions I mean you hear about unicorns like the billion dollar company but like that number is astronomical yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a big number i remember when we first raised our first round of funding at a valuation over a billion dollars which was i think april 2014 so not mm -hmm. long after we actually launched right 
um, and it blew me away. I, I mean, it, it's such an abstract number, it right? Is, it's yeah, like it's hard to even understand yeah, what that is, right? So, <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about integrated marketing communication. So. In IMC and in communications, we often have, um, you know, the sender of a message and the receiver of a message. And, you know, for for years, um, for yourself working in kind of B2B, working in sales and in marketing, um, how, um, how, how much is communication impacting your relationship with your customer? When we understand people hear different things than what we say, and there's all kinds of like uh, uh, noise in the messaging that we mm-hmm. send. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of implicit information too, right? Mm. So I think that uh, there's a huge amount of fluency that people have to have, I think, in understanding, like, the context of their audience. Um, I always try and look at it through kind of two lenses at the same time. And, and this is very much kind of like what people talk about right brain, left brain. Yep. So, like, a very analytic approach. Mm-hmm. Um, so very driven by, like, what are the key um key things people do how do we instrument things so that we can understand those how do we add those up in aggregates how do we understand the insights in the data how do we make sense of that how do we parse it how do we build segments out of it yeah and then the flip side of that is all the human stories yeah and you need both of them to actually understand i think in any way the customer or the prospective customer or not the customer which is as important right in order to be able to effectively market and tell a story which is really what you're trying to do yeah that's great. So like the hybrid approach of having kind of the human connection as well as an understanding of analytics and data and things yeah, like that. Y- y- it, both are essential. Um, one without the other is like clapping with one hand, <laughs> right? Yeah. Doesn't work. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was something I think that was really um, well understood at the Slack team really, really early on mm. um, that both were essential to it. Like you can collect all the data, you can instrument your product, um, you can understand the analytics and everything like that. That won't tell you what decision to make. Yeah, You can understand the customer, you can understand their story, their anxieties, their fears, their concerns, yeah. all the stuff that happens that drives their um, behavior. Yeah, That won't tell you what to do either. Right. Those are the two kind of like inputs that help you make the right decisions. Right. And yeah. help you revise your decisions because like mm. decisions are always temporary yeah okay that's that's great so in imc we've got this uh sales funnel that we talk about um let we say ada attention interest desire and action uh this path that our customers take like some kind of customer journey so how how did that play out when you were at slack yeah, it's a good question. Um, we talked about a few different frameworks. Um, ADA is, I think, a very effective one. Um, and it's very effective, I think, really early on in a process mm-hmm. when you're trying to build a marketing plan. Mm-hmm. And once you've got one up and running, mm-hmm. um, and in a way, you have to kind of like forget it in the middle mm-hmm. and actually just talk to people and understand their motivations, their concerns and stuff so, like that. So you talk, to, talk to me about that. Why, why sure. does that become important? Sure. So... Um, I, th- I think it's really important at the beginning because it forces you through a framework approach to think about all the different questions that you have to be able to answer mm-hmm. um, in a structured way. Yeah. Um, the thing that I would add on to ADA, so uh, attention, interest, desire, action, is then like, what's the ongoing action? Ours was a software product, so understand very much like the nature of your product and its relationship with the customer because yeah. that was very much... Um, acquisition of customers if you will okay and so we talked about ada very much in acquisition of customers yeah and in maybe behavior we talked about abc so acquisition behavior conversion uh-huh. and um so early on in particular we worked really with an ada kind of framework um but as you become sort of a software as a service company you become really a subscription company so yeah. how do you then uh, essentially pay people back or provide them real value on the attention that they're giving you, yeah. right? So um, you've got the acquisition, interest, desire, action, but like then what is the outcome, right? right? Yeah. So like as much as anything, that's really what we wanted to focus on is yeah. providing that ongoing lasting value. Yeah. And you see more and more products shifting to that now where they're really trying to focus on ongoing long-term customer relationships. Even if you think about like, you know, a lot of consumer products that we think of as like transactional, like, um what's a good example um milk so you buy milk right but milk is pretty much a subscription product because you buy it every two weeks at the grocery store and you bite this and stuff like that right like most of those they're not subscriptions formally but they're actually subscription kind of action products right and interesting with milk because i think it used to be a subscription product when the milkman came to your house every week or two weeks or whatever it was exactly 
but long before Amazon came along <laughs> to sell subscriptions. And in lots right? of places in the world, there's still the milkman that comes to sure. to the door, right? Yeah. But uh, I think it actually, like running shoes, for example, are a subscription product. Sure. Just nobody subscribes to like the same yeah. thing. And I think there's a huge opportunity. This is like a bit weird, but like there's a huge opportunity actually for like Adidas or Nike or something like that to say like, you love this brand. Yeah. You love this product within it. Actually, we'll just send you a new pair every four months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Right. Like you wear them out at that rate. Yeah. We, we can figure that out. So like, why don't, why don't we actually make it a subscription product? Yeah. I like that. One thing you mentioned is paying back your customers. Mm. Like what does, what does that mean to you? Um, well, I think part of it is just honoring the thing that they're giving you, which is their attention. Um, in our case, for the very much like we needed a very much bottoms up approach to software adoption. So it wasn't like we were selling to like the CEO or the CFO. We were very much selling to like the engineering manager or right. like the developer or like the designer or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So like being able to pay them back so that it was valuable for them to then advocate for your product was incredibly powerful for mm. us to be able to understand the mechanics of how we actually were able to um uh make people successful with the product right okay like without that there was no traction there was yeah. nothing like that right so yeah. like we we had no business without being able to like be incredibly valuable to people yeah. all, already right and in a way become like a, a hallmark or like a marker um that they could demonstrate as a signifier that um they worked a different way right yeah Okay, that's interesting. If you will. So how do you measure or what metrics would you use to say, yes, integrated marketing communications, we're good at this or we're not or we fail or we're successful? How do we know? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, marketing is in service to the business overall. So um, what does the business overall need to do? And right. then like, how do you understand the market and um, shape the efforts you make to build the business, right? right? Like, I think marketing in many ways um, in a modern world kind of gets, um, it kind of gets like uh, diminished, if you will. Marketing, I think, in many ways should be as important as the product of the company that the company sells, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if you talk about product market fit, it's not like, well, the product, the product, the product. Yeah. Like, it's the market that yeah. makes the product, right? Right. And marketing has to be the expert inside an organization mm. at that market. Right. So, like, how do you know your market? Right. How do you um, speak to your market? How do you uh, go to market and understand who your customers are and who they aren't? How do right. you understand how to get the actions that you want? Yeah. Them, right. Yeah. So, I, I to take a step back, like, I think, like, marketing in many ways has seeded its influence within organizations. Um, and there's an opportunity for marketing to take that back and to really be the expert on the market. Yeah. Um, but you asked me a different question, which is like, how do you know how you're doing? Um, so marketing is in service to the business. So yeah. what does the business need to do? Yeah. Therefore, marketing needs to drive the part of that business to make it happen, right? Yeah. So marketing has to be the part of the organization that is in the ex- the experts on the customer and the non-customer. And right. non-customer, I mean like any um, go-to-market plan has to have targeting, right? So it's for these people, but not for these people. Right. And the earlier you are, the fewer people that you want to target yeah. because then you can be more specific yeah. and you can be more tactical and you can you just have less resources to right. work on it, right? So you have fewer feedbacks yeah. um, and you have less understanding of the market. Yeah. Later on, you can expand. Yeah. But like I see all the time um, startups and they're like, we're going to target like the real estate agent industry. And I'm yeah. like, the real estate agent industry is immense, right? Like, is it commercial real estate? Is right. it residential real estate? Too broad. Yeah, right? Yeah. Is it like this segment of the market or this segment of the market? Yeah. So like anytime that you get anywhere below just the surface depth, then you have to do segmentation. So like yeah. what does segmentation look like and what are the appropriate segments to make? Yeah. And people often make like the easy segments instead of the segments that actually matter. And by easy, I mean things that are like predetermined for you in reports. So mm. like ge- geography or industry or right. income level or age or like demographic yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. right? And a lot of that can be really valuable, but a lot of it's only valuable looking back right. once you actually have customers. Sure. It's far less valuable directionally looking forward to like right. who is this for. Yeah. It's much more valuable in my mind to be looking forward at need based. Or one of the frameworks that I often use is jobs to be done. Yeah. So like jobs to be done is like, what is the job that the customer is hiring the product or service to do? Right. Yeah. What problem is it solving? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and okay. w- is it worth solving for people? So, yeah. like for Slack, when we were going to market, we had this. Co- we we were competing against kind of this cobbled together. Like it's nobody's job to solve communication in our company. Nobody chooses these tools. So and so brought this in, and we used yeah. this because like it was part of the software package that we got and stuff yeah. like that. So how do you sell against that? Right. right. Yeah. Um, is really the challenge. Okay. So when we're so so Slack being uh, in the B two B world. Yeah. Um, how important are stories in marketing communications and how, and you kind of referenced earlier kind of the, the tension of stories and, and relationships with maybe analytics. Um, how important are stories in the communication and how would you guys go about communicating in stories? Uh, I mean, stories were essential to Slack success right from the get go. Um, so a couple of examples of that. Um, one of the things we did was wrote the terms of service so that the default was that we could use your name in talking about like your success with the product. Oh, interesting. So we didn't have to go to you for permission. Yeah. The second thing um, that we would do is whenever we would do a customer interviews, we would take all these notes and stuff like that. And then almost always we would send you the notes mm-hmm. and excerpt parts of it and say, this is what I heard you say. Yeah. Um, is that something we could use? Oh, great. And then Just you by would default. Use, use that on Instagram or on web or wherever, yeah. wherever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did something called, uh, we had a really active Twitter account. So mm-hmm. Twitter was a really effective channel for us because yeah. we were mostly targeting tech nerds and tech nerds are on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and people all of a sudden said like, oh, Slack, do you do this? So we did like tech support through Slack. We did like our release log of like new versions of the software. Yeah. Went out um, through a hashtag called change log. Right. And then you could see like all the different versions. Okay. Um, and then we started collecting tweets back to us, which were like, I love this product. or This right. is great. Or this solves my this problem for me or something like yeah. that. And we created something we called the wall of love, which was just like a collection of all these tweets. And so if somebody was ever skeptical about, like, well, will this work? Right. You know, does, you know, I, I don't believe it'll do that or something. Well, it might or it might not. Right. Here's what other people are saying. Well, where is the wall of love? It was a digital product? Yeah. Is it a picture? Yeah, it was digital to yeah. start with. And it was like, it was actually a discontinued Twitter product um, called, it's not lists, but something like lists. Yeah. I mean, Twitter's kind of like a train wreck of a product. But, right. <laughs> um, so they discontinue all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and so we, and it had been end of life. Yeah. And so we knew people at Twitter. So they said to us, like, we're actually not working on that. And like, right. we're going to discontinue it. So yeah. don't invest in it. And we were like, shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had reached the end of it. We, we put like, I don't know, 11,000 tweets in it or something like that. And oh, you're only wow. supposed to put like 2,000. And- right. <laughs> That's where owning your own assets becomes really important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So we we had a feed of it, and we could do our own things yeah. with it and stuff like that. But yeah. still, it was a bit of a pain. But yeah. um, okay, that's it was a quick and dirty way of doing it too, where yeah. it's like people say nice things, so like collect it for them, make it yeah. super easy. Yeah. Um, and then just the empathizing with your customer, I think, is incredibly important. So like, what is the challenge that they're going to face internally in trying to sell this product to mm-hmm. their peers? Right. Right. Does it work? Yes. Okay, great. Is it worth me changing? Like, get off my porch. I don't want change. Like, right. everybody's like that, right? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. You think you, like, you want me to learn something new? Yeah. So we used to talk about, like, the suck hump, which is, like, this this point in time where, like, you actually get worse before you get better. Right. Trying something new, right? Yeah. So you have to get people over the suck hump <laughs> to even discover your product. Right. Um, and then we tried to bake things into the product that took away all the objections people could have. Yeah. So like, oh, I don't want to pay for this. It's like, how am I? How am I even going to know how many people are going to use it? Okay, right. well, don't don't guess. We'll just charge you for the active ones. Right. So we created something called the fair billing policy, which is like every month you would pay for the product. Great, and we'll tell you how many people are using it. Right. And oh, here's wow. what the rules are around like how we determine that. So yeah. we were transparent with that. Yeah. Because it took away that objection. It was just like yeah. people were like, oh, okay, well that seems fair. Right. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating, um, and that obviously worked well. In the long term for the yeah, company. Yeah, and they still do it. Right. We, we, what we discovered, though, is as you get into bigger companies, they're like, I don't want to deal with that headache. That sure. means I have to go to accounting, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I just want a static number, right? Yeah, yeah. So then we See, move to just like annual licenses and all you can eat. And there's, they've got all kinds of like more advanced licensing right, now. Yeah. Right. That's great. But again, like your customers pull that out of you in many ways. Yeah. And so staying in touch with your customers and getting back to stories like we were yeah. initially talking about, the stories um, are incredibly valuable for prospective customers but they're also incredibly valuable internally yeah. to tell you directionally what you need to do and to have conversations internally about decisions you're making yeah because um, as a company you're making decisions on behalf of your customers all the time yeah so how do you make the right decisions that they would want you to make yeah that's great 
That's super interesting. James, this has been a really great conversation. Um, I really appreciate you spending some time with us today, hearing about, you know, kind of the beginning of Slack up to where it was today, and also what you're working on now is really interesting. My pleasure, Jared. You carry an immense amount of knowledge that we can all learn from, so that's great. (laughs) Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. 